Uh, in the first service, I, I, I called uh, all the campus pastors up here without giving them warning, and it was so funny because Dustin Dozier was in the kids' building. It was hilarious. I thought he was in the restroom, which would have been much more embarrassing. Um, but anyway, he, he came up here by the time I finished, but, uh, but I told them to, to go ahead and, and go have family time, not to have to sit here for uh, two services. But I wanted to take this opportunity because I know we still have... Uh, folks uh, at home uh, from all campuses. This is a unique opportunity on a Sunday morning when we can, we can be all together and uh, worship together, all five of our campuses, even though I know we've just gone through Christmas Eve. A lot of people are out of town, but man, I tell you what, the really beautiful uh, worship services, both of these services. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about these two guys. Now, not to uh, take anything away from uh, Brother Wes Walker. Wes is up there actually in the sound booth running some of the sound and lighting and all of that today. So our executive pastor of Creative Arts, is, is he's serving. So a lot of times when you don't see Wes, he's, he's doing stuff like that all over the place. Uh, but Randy is uh, our, our worship pastor for traditional and blended worship. Uh, he, he leads this wonderful choir and orchestra every Sunday morning. And aren't you grateful for their investment today? Man, what a blessing. And uh, Randy, Randy's been here for many moons. I mean, I know looking at him, you can't tell. He looks 25, but, uh, you know, and that you owe me, buddy. Yeah. But Randy's been here a long time, and, um, and, and God's used him and is still using him. We're grateful for him. Uh, Larry Rockwell uh, has been here, how long now? Five, five years, he and Katie. And Larry's, his position's really evolved over time, but I won't, I, it's, it's really needs to be uh, emphasized. Larry plans the, the worship services and builds the teams for all four of the other campuses in addition to the, the third service downtown. So he's working with, just give me a guess, how many different people on a Sunday morning are, are leading worship in one of the teams? Between 50 and 80. Yeah. Between 50 and 80 people that uh, Larry leads in, in Sunday morning worship in some area and at some geographical address in the name of Upstate Church and First Baptist Simpsonville. I just wanted you to be able to have this, the opportunity to gather as one church to thank God for Randy and for Larry. Would you thank God for them? Thank you, guys. <laughs> Appreciate y'all. Yeah, man, love y'all. Uh, man, what a what an opportunity today is! I know when we think about the day after Christmas, probably a lot of things uh, run through our minds. But I've been kind of surprised so far today. I have not seen anybody in pajamas. Now you may have. Okay, I'm not going to point you out if uh, if you have the moan. All right, I tried to make everybody feel comfortable if their kids came in, in pajamas because day after Christmas is usually a chill day. I mean, in most cases, but this has been an opportunity for us to worship. If it's Sunday morning. Um, we want to worship. And uh, Amy and I, a few years back, maybe uh, right before COVID, decided to take the last Sunday in the year to go and, and worship at another church, kind of to learn best practices and, and to just worship together without having to be a part of the investment of the worship. And, uh, and, and I tell you what was unique is as we, we look for a church, it's amazing how many churches don't have church on the last Sunday in the year. Did you know this? It, 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 maybe you didn't. There are a ton of churches that just decide to call off worship on the last Sunday in the year. Um, it's, as far as I am concerned, we will really never do that, all right? Our, our hope would be if it's a Sunday, then, uh, then we're going to have worship. We'll have some kind of worship. And I know when Christmas Eve services, when you talk about 4,000 people coming together on Christmas Eve, when it's so close to Sunday, it's really difficult. But I think your presence here today, along with a, a full crowd in the last service as well, is testimony that God's people want to come together and worship on Sunday. And so I'm grateful uh, for you and for your being here today. It means a lot um, that you're here. So I wanted to take a, a minute just to uh, kind of unpack a little bit, uh, build a bridge in a sense from where we've been in this whole Christmas series into a kind of a new year idea, transitioning into 2022. What do we do with this? Um, I, I know that we started several weeks back in this series we've, we've called Why Christmas? And we talked about the timing, why now? We talked about uh, Mary, why Mary, why Joseph? And then we landed at Christmas Eve, no matter what campus you attend, we answered the question, why Jesus on Christmas Eve services? 
And so with, with that in mind, it's easy to kind of uh, look at Christmas and even the day after Christmas and just kind of think, okay, let's continue to, to just deal with Christmas. In fact, as I've seen people, I just can't help but say Merry Christmas. It's the day after Christmas, but I'm still saying Merry Christmas, but I guess the day after now you can throw in Happy New Year too, right? So that's kind of the official thing, I guess. But, uh, but you know, when does Christmas really, you need to stop celebrating Christmas. Um, is it after you start taking down the decorations? Uh, even this morning, I mean, I've already started saying, when are we going to do that? When are we going to take down the decorations? It's the day after Christmas. And it's easy to kind of look at the day after a major event like Christmas, in this case, the birth, the celebration of the birth of our Savior, and kind of think the next day is an insignificant day. It'd be really easy for us to just kind of take a deep breath and say, Phew. You know, the day after is usually not nearly as important as the day of these major events. But I think in the life of Jesus, we would all agree that while the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, that's the incarnation, there's no way we can overemphasize the importance of uh, God becoming flesh. This is obviously a massive monumental day. He could have never died for our sins had he not been born in Bethlehem. But the next day was just as important as that day. If you think about it in the sense of all 33 years of the life of Jesus were valuable, were important. And, and, and God in our lives is working not only in the major events. He's not just working when there are 3,800 people in Christmas Eve services. He's also working when there are 10 people in a small group. God is constantly working, not just in the big events, but also the next days. And that's kind of the lens through which I want us to look at John's gospel. If you look with me again at John's gospel, we have been in Matthew chapter one, we've been in Luke chapter two, and, uh, and I think all campus pastors, teaching pastors have looked at John chapter one at some point during this Christmas season. We're gonna be in the gospel of John for the next 30 minutes. And, and as we walk through the gospel of John, we're not just looking at John one, even though that's where we're going to start, but we're gonna look at three big stories and we're gonna look at those stories through the lens of the next day. All right, it's a very different kind of message for me. Normally we pick out one passage of scripture, we walk through it verse by verse kind of in an expositional manner. This is not topical, it's definitely textual, but it's three separate passages as we look through the lens of these words the next day. The words the next day are actually uh, written five times in the Gospel of John. And so you may say, well, you had a lot of time on your hand, Wayne, when you're just, you know, checking out the words the next day. But I wanted to see, you know, how many next days were there in John's gospel? And so uh, we'll get to those in just a moment. Let's begin by kind of reading the foundational text we've looked at already this Christmas season. Begin in John chapter one with me in verse one, as we look at that parallel, first of all, in the creation story, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not comprehended it. Or, uh, I just lost my place terribly. Isn't that terrible? Thank you, verse five. I hear you, I hear that witness, my wife. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. I've never told y'all this probably, but I really do believe the Holy Spirit speaks through my wife, amen? The light shines in darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You know what I was doing? I was quoting New King James when I was reading ESV. That's challenging. Y'all can tell I'm ADD, all right? So the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Speaking of John the Baptist, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Speaking of Israel, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
And the word became flesh. There's Bethlehem. The word became flesh, dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and full of truth. And so as we read those foundational passages, it brings us from creation to Bethlehem. And, uh, and, and then we shift gears in the same chapter to a, a, a really a presentation of John the Baptist in greater detail. The religious leaders come to um, John the Baptist. They actually send representatives, Pharisees, to John the Baptist, asking him a very simple question, who are you? I mean, they just wanted to know, who are you? I mean, we got all these people coming out here to check you out. You're baptizing people. You're, you're preaching repentance. Who are you? Uh, and, and John's answer in a very short summary would be simply, I am no one important. I mean, it's just basically take the spotlight off of me because I am not worthy of worship. I'm not worthy of praise. I'm not worthy of a spotlight. I'm just the forerunner. The, the one who's coming after me, I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes, man. I am a servant and he is going to be our savior. So John kind of sets it up in chapter one, verse 19 through 28. And he tries to explain that he is not the Messiah um, and he is not worthy to even be compared to the Messiah. But then in verse 29, say the first three words with me. The next day. Say them with me. The next day. So on the next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Here he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Not speaking just of his birth, but speaking more so as Jesus was truly the preexistent one. He was the one through whom all thing had been made. This was John chapter one that we just read. Jesus was very different from John the Baptist. This was not just God the son, but, but not just the son of God, but God the son. So one thing we notice right off the bat is the next day, the next day. So these next days all seem to reinforce the person of Jesus. And as we walk through these stories, we're going to see over and over again that even the overarching idea of the next days in John are to point to the identity of Jesus Christ. So John the Baptist says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So John the Baptist declares who Jesus really was. This is the Messiah. This is the Lamb of God. But then Revelation 13, 8 tells us he's not just the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but points back again to this John 1 narrative in a sense because it presents him as the, as the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. As much as we can't comprehend all of this, the fact of the matter is... Um, Jesus, though born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, uh, was existing even in the beginning. God the Son was involved. All things were made by him, through him, and for him. And Paul even emphasizes this and reinforces it in the book of Colossians. And so we, we see and we understand that even all things hold together. They consist by the power of of the son. And so this is, is a very important understanding, the lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. So this is another testimony to the beauty and the consistency of the word of God. All through the word, though authored by so many different people, imperfect people, inspired by the Holy Spirit, we see that Jesus is at the center of every book of the Bible. Though it may not even mention him by name, obviously in the Old Testament, all of Scripture points to the coming hope of the world, the Messiah, and Jesus, the Lamb of God, truly is the hope that we speak of. So let's look at another next day, another next day. John chapter 6, if you will turn over a few chapters, John chapter 6 presents the feeding of the 5,000, a story that you all know very well, the feeding of the 5,000. One of the greatest miracles recorded in scripture. We've all heard the story of the boy with the sack lunch and how this boy with five loaves of cinnamon chip bread and uh, two fish, no, not really cinnamon chip, all right, uh, and two fish come, 
comes to the disciples. They bring the, the meal to Jesus, and Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fish, and he feeds 5,000 people plus their families. It's a remarkable story. It's, it's um, uh, unimaginable, and it's, it's amazing. But even with this story, we understand this is the event, right? This is the big deal. This is the major thing. And I would say this is the story we remember. We focus on the miracle. We focus on, if we're not careful, the 3,800 <laughs> at Christmas Eve. You know, if we're not careful, we focus on Bethlehem at the cost of everything else. But there's always a next day. There's always a next day. And in this story, the next day is very significant. If we're not careful, we focus on the miracles of Jesus. In this case, the feeding of the 5,000, and we miss the entire message that Jesus was trying to get across. So what happened the next day? Look at verse 22. John chapter 6, verse 22. On, say it with me, the next day. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Look at 24. So then the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples. They themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? In other words, why did you leave us without letting us know? I mean, we, were, we had a great meal with you, and then you just disappeared. And Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. In other words, you just want more food. The only reason you're coming to me is so that I could provide you with more, so that you could maybe see another miracle or that you could get your belly full. Um, but then in verse 27, listen to what he said. He said, do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So in other words, look, you need to focus your attention away from the provision and you need to look to the Savior. You need to stop looking for the next best miracle. You need to stop looking just at the big event, but, but the next day you need to find the actual substance and the source of all of this supply. They said to him, what sign do you do? What, what trick are you going to show us next that we may see and believe? <laughs> what, what work do you perform? And then they kind of look back and give him an example. Look, our, our fathers ate the man in the wilderness. It was written. Uh, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. He's basically saying that manna was just a picture of the real bread to come. Don't get confused and distracted by a, a little symbol and miss the substance altogether. Don't, don't get so fixed fixated and, and, and uh, attracted to the shiny gift under the tree and, and miss the actual greatest gift that God has ever given to mankind, and that is the, the gift of his son, Jesus. Uh, it says, for the bread of God, verse 33, is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, listen, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. The bread is standing in front of you. I, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. So Jesus continued teaching a, a very confrontational word. In fact, beyond 35, I'm telling you, he says some hard things. He literally says things like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And you may say, that is crazy. What is he? Well, obviously, he was talking about unless you are marked and identified with my death, my burial, my resurrection, you can't be my disciples. He, he, was, he was speaking a hard saying, and it was very difficult. Uh, look, he was making it very clear in everything that he said here in, in this chapter that the decision to follow Jesus is not a decision to enjoy the bread that he gives you. 
A decision to follow Jesus is not a decision to be a part of a great church with a wonderful orchestra, choir, great praise band. That's not what it means to follow Jesus. Look, a decision to follow Jesus is not just a decision to be a good dad or a good husband, a mom or, or a wife or a child. Look, that's, that's not what, you know what it means? It means literally to abandon everything and follow him, to, to commit your life to him. This is what it means to follow Jesus. And it doesn't mean we're perfect. We fail God. And, and honestly, before the the Lord, you can make a public profession of faith and repent of your sins and, and, and not, and not uh, uh, completely stay faithful. You could definitely veer off and have moments, uh, if not uh, seasons of weakness and failure. But, but here's the truth. There has to be a moment where you turn from your sin and yourself and you turn to Jesus. There has to be a moment where you stop depending on the bread of this world and, and you really trust it in, in truly the bread from heaven. That you stop thirsting for the water of materialism and, and, and fame and, and, you, and you're really thirsty. You find out that the only satisfaction for your thirst is the living water that Jesus Christ provides. So there was no in-between follower of Jesus. He required no less than everything. In verse 60, we see what we were talking about, about the, the hard saying and how Jesus was not <laughs> tiptoeing around the tulips. He was preaching it straight to them. When many of the disciples, verse 60, heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. They're like, man, this is tough preaching. Who can listen to it? Look at verse 66. After this Many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? I want you to think about this on, on, on this next day, the day after Christmas. This may seem a little odd, but I think it's a, it's a statement that needs to be made. It's a commitment that you need to hear. And that is this. That there will come a time, even though right now, just to be honest with you, our church is growing like crazy. You know, Christmas Eve is one thing, but on any given Sunday morning, 24, 20, 23, 2400 people in December have been physically sitting in a chair at First Baptist Simpson or Upstate Church Campus every Sunday. That's, that's a remarkable blessing. God is blessing. We're, we're seeing a lot of growth. God is using your church. But there may come a day when people hear the truth of God's word, and they, they believe it to be too hard of a saying for them to stay. And here's the commitment that you have from every teaching pastor in our church. I believe every minister and every staff member, every deacon in our church, there will never be a time where we compromise the truth of God's word to keep somebody here. Never. You're never gonna hear a half truth. Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. And if we're representing him, if we're following him, we are not going to speak half truths. And we've got to remember that our goal is not to keep big crowds. Our goal is to make much of Jesus. Our goal is to introduce people who live in darkness in the upstate of South Carolina to Jesus Christ, who is the light of their world. He's the only one who can change things. And so this is a very important thing for us to understand, even as Jesus is the demonstration he spoke truth, and sometimes when you speak truth, people go away. And Jesus looked at the most faithful of his followers, and he said literally these words, do you want to go away as well? Whew. It's pretty tough. So this next day is just an, another story pointing straight to Jesus as being the Messiah, the Savior of the world. The crowds were following Jesus, looking for the next big miracle, and some simply followed him, hoping to get fed again. They were seeking earthly bread. So as we prepare for the new year, as we kind of look ahead, uh, I pray that we will intentionally consider the first two stories and think about these lessons that I hope we will learn. Like John the Baptist, let's stay humble in 2022, making sure that we keep things in perspective, that we remember no matter what happens, no matter how God uses us, no matter how God uses you as individual followers of his, that we will remember at the end of the day, we are nothing. We are not worthy to tie the shoes of our Savior. He is so far greater. We are not worthy. He is the master, and we are but his servants. 
Next, let's learn the lesson from the day after the feeding of the 5,000. Listen to the words of Jesus again. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. So, so don't, don't work for material things. Don't, don't worship material things. And that may, <laughs> that may seem like a strange thing to say the day after we just opened so many material things. Don't miss the greatest gift because we become so obsessed and fixated on the other less important gifts that God has given to us. Don't be so attracted to the physical bread that we miss the bread of life. Man, he is so good to us. I know that we, we have so many, our, our kids have enjoyed gifts and giving and, and, and I, I, it's one of my favorite things in, in the year is being able to be at Christmas time. But, but boy, it's on the day after Christmas, a lot of what we do is we kind of go back and we, we go through all the other stuff usually. We see what all we got again. We play with all the new toys and maybe the loudest toys get played with the most. Have you ever noticed that? It's always crazy. Lexi got some kind of moon cart or something. I'm not sure what it's called, but it's this like little four-wheel uh, cart that, uh, that has fans on it. And it doesn't fly, but it's, it's this, you're going to think I'm lying. This is so true. And somehow you turn it on and it sounds something like this. I'm sorry if it's really loud. But it's like 10 times that loud. I mean, it's like crazy loud. And these fans, you got to let them run for like five seconds. And undoubtedly, the, the, the fans create some kind of suction because maybe they're, they're pushing back. And so it, it, it pushes it down. And then you can start going with the remote control. And in the car, no lie, will climb the wall. And then it will, it will go. You're going to think I'm telling a lie. It will crawl on the ceiling. This is nuts. But the noise is God awful loud. And so it's like, zing. And that's naturally what everybody wanted to do for a while. So I can't concentrate. Y'all know I've told you I have attention problems. I can't even like have a conversation if the thing's like on in, within a three block radius of the house. I mean, it's like, I can't talk. So uh, your kids are probably opening all kinds of stuff. Your grandkids, they're enjoying all these gifts and, and, and just let, let's enjoy them. We should enjoy Christmas. We should enjoy gift giving. We're never more like Jesus than when we're giving. Jesus gave everything. So we should be generous people who love to give and love to, to uh, enjoy family time. But God forbid that we get so distracted and messed up in our way of thinking that we think those things are the best part of Christmas. That we get so distracted by the meal and, and, the, and the multiplication of the loaves and the bread that we miss Jesus. God forbid, and so this, this Christmas leading into 2022, I mean, let's make a commitment to listen to the words of Jesus. Do not labor for the food that perishes. Don't labor for the material things that will burn up. Let's invest our lives, let's invest our year in the things that are gonna, that are gonna last forever, endure to eternal life. God help us to focus on the things that matter most. The message of all three stories is a message of the gospel. And that is that it is all about Jesus. There's one final next day found in the book of John, John chapter 12. Go and turn a few more chapters and we'll, we'll finish up. John chapter 12, you know this story too. It's a big event. Mary is anointing Jesus at Bethany. So Bethany is at the top of the Mount of Olives. I get to go back, hopefully, Lord willing, and the border opens to Israel. About 35 folks are going to be going with me to Israel, me and Will, uh, in the next couple of weeks. I can't wait. Um, but uh, but there, one of the places we visit is Mount of Olives. And so Jesus was at Bethany. Mary was anointing him there. And, uh, and, and a man named Lazarus, you might have heard of him, was in the, in the house. This is the same Lazarus that was raised from the dead. There's quite a commotion in the community over this man who had been dead, yet brought back to life, you might imagine, right? And so we see here in John 12 that this is the setting. This is the big event. 
the, the anointing of Jesus at Bethany. So let's look at the next day. Look there with me, John chapter 12, verse 12, and say the three words with me. The next day, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now this story, like the others, is a super significant story and we understand it's called the triumphal entry. We look at it oftentimes the week before Easter because this is the the entrance of Jesus into the Passion Week. And so this next day, though it follows a significant event in Bethany, is no less significant. This is a a grand day. It was the beginning of uh, the Passion Week, which would lead to uh, his death on the cross and his being placed in a borrowed tomb and his resurrection on the third day. And so with that, it was a fulfillment of prophecy, even here in verse 12, a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, Again, confirming that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the King of glory. Our takeaway from this story, we could spend a lot of time, I know, today talking about this in particular. These could be easily three messages, to be honest with you. Um, But our takeaway is, is, I believe, man, Jesus is not is not just king of kings in some really nice symbolic way, but he's the king of our hearts. As we have become followers of Jesus, he truly sits on the throne of our heart. This is where not just we, we can put him, is where he belongs. He is the ruler of our hearts. Now, like the people there in in Jerusalem on that day, we, we get confused sometimes. There's no doubt that some of these people thought that Jesus was going to be the king of Israel in the traditional sense, in the physical sense, that Jesus was going to sit on David's throne, that Jesus was going to make things right with Rome. He was going to deliver his people physically from bondage, but, but man, they misunderstood what he was coming to do is be a king far more powerful than that a king that's far greater than a king of of a physical country. And here's the significance today. We could lose sight and and we could start getting distracted and misunderstand the significance of Jesus in our lives. And, And we could on Sundays throw down the palm branches and say, oh, he's the king of glory. But then on Monday, we depend on Biden or Trump. Y'all all right? I mean, listen, either he's the king or he's not. Either Jesus is the king of your life or he is not. And so we've got to get to the point, not just, not just on Sundays, but on the next days. Jesus is just as much king. He deserves just as much glory. And he is worthy of just as much praise on the next day as he is today. There's only one thing. There's only one person who is worthy of our obsession, worthy of our surrender. So my prayer is that we would give Jesus our everything in 2022. The truth is, man, it's so, so insufficient to say this. He's worthy. Man, Jesus is worthy of our everything. Lord, we love you. God, I pray that you would teach us to give you our next days. Not just the big events, not just the days we celebrate that get all the fanfare. Not just the days where we unwrap a bunch of presents under a tree. Not just the days where we have a ton of people in a service. But God, on our next days, God, would you give us the strength to give you all of ourselves that that we'd recognize it's just not Sunday that you sit on our throne. But God, you're on the throne of our heart every moment of every day. You are our Lord. We love you. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me?